Okay, now we're going to start the specifics of the medication. We have the famous stimulants. The stimulants are the medications which are indicated for attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. And attention deficit hyperactivity disorder is not necessarily only the hyperactive kids. It could be the kids that have inattention or the combined, right, inattention of a hyperactive. The children that are usually identified, though, in the classroom, the first ones are the hyperactive ones, the ones that have those disruptive behaviors, um, more so than the, the kids that have problems with inattention. And we have different types. The different types of medications, actually, these are the medications that have been studied the most in the child population. Um, we have studies back, you know, 1960s and long-term uh, medication effects. But we have the methylphenidates, for example, one group, uh, and then the amphetamines. In the methylphenidate group, we have the Ritalin, the Concerta, Metadate, Datrana, Focalin. Now they've come up with a pro uh, uh, centra, which is kind of a metadate, which is in a liquid form. So they're they're trying to ha the the pharmaceutical companies are trying to come up with different presentations so it's easier for the kids, obviously, to to take the medications as well. And then we have the amphetamines, like the, uh, the Adderall, the Dexedrine. We have the new one called Vyvanse. Um, so there are many different ones uh, on the market. Is, there a, is one better than the other? No. It depends on the, kind of the, the specifics of the ADHD presentation, as well as the response the child has to the medication, usually. A child, if they don't respond to one, they will respond to the other type. Um, more than 70% of the, of the individuals that are correctly diagnosed right, with ADHD are responders to the stimulants. And Adderall, here we have an FDA approval for uh, kids that are less than six years old. What dosage do we use for these children? Well, usually the dosage is, is per, per kilo uh, per day, but the dosage is actually adjusted to the side effects and to the response to the medication. And what are the expected results? Well, this is really straightforward. With the stimulants, it's basically the expected results or what the main issue is, which is either the hyperactivity or the inattention or combined based on the level of functioning in the area that we're talking about. Now, when we talk about stimulants, stimulants may be, if you can get the longest period of effectivity, it's going to be about 12 hours, maybe with on, on the Vyvanse, for example. Or if you use the short-acting ones, like a six-hour one, and you give it two times a day. So when this occurs... If you really think about it, they start at about 6.30 in the morning, 7 for academics. They come home. The kids have their homework. The medication is pretty much out of the system around 5 or 6 in the afternoon. And that's if we're, if, if we're getting a, a, a long effect. Usually in teenagers, you'll have that long effect. And the younger ones know because they metabolize quicker, so the medication will be out of their system much faster. So the stimulants are usually used when the, medic when the disruptive behavior or the inattention affects the academics, right? the academic milieu. And when we talk about academic milieu, we're not talking only about math and science. We're talking about peer interaction. We're talking about being able to go out on the playground during recess and have a positive interaction with the peers as well without the pushing, the tripping, the running off, th those kind of things. What risks and side effects are there uh, with the stimulants? Well, there, there is a warning with stimulants that there might be sudden death. Okay. And this is something, of course, when you read the inserts, that is, is, is bothersome. I mean, it's, it's very scary for a parent. Well, what if the stimulants can cause sudden death? There have been some cases of sudden death, and the cases of sudden death have been related to cardiac problems, all the cardiac problems that have been pre-existing. So the stimulant itself doesn't cause cardiac problems, but if there has been a cardiac problem underlying, 
then these were the cases where when they, you know, an autopsy they checked, that they, they existed. Now, that's why a full history is so important. But not all cardiac problems can be identified or have been identified just in a pediatric uh, appointment, a yearly appointment. So these are some things that we need to watch out for. Stimulants can increase the blood pressure, usually in adults, not so much in kids, and it can increase heart rate. So it's very important that during the follow-ups, heart rate as well as, um, as well as the blood pressure are checked. This is why it's also very important when medication is started that the kids be evaluated within the first two weeks of starting medication not because we're going to see a response in two weeks, although stimulants kick in quickly, but because we need to make sure that we're covering for all the side effects. Other side effects that are more common can include headache, stomach ache. We always advise that the stimulants be taken with food. By taking it with food, there's a less, less chance of, and we're talking about protein, not the Pop-Tart, where it's the glass of milk, right? Um, or cheese, or some type of protein that helps with decreasing the possibility of having the stomach ache. And it actually helps with absorption some. Lots of kids, unfortunately, with the stimulants can have trouble getting to sleep. And that's something we always have to monitor as well. Because one of the, let's say, the highest... Um, or one of the one of the let's see sleep hygiene can be one of the a poor sleep hygiene can be one of the biggest cause of ADHD like symptoms so not ADHD itself but if you keep a child up right the next day they'll be cranky they won't be able to follow directions they're all kind of inattentive i mean you can see all, almost all the ADHD symptoms so if you have a child on a stimulant that helps with ADHD but then they're sleep deprived you're going to have some of these ADHD symptoms the next day, and then it seems like it's not being effective or it's not an effective medication. So we have to watch out for the insomnia that may be caused by the stimulants as well. So then at that point, we might have to help the kids with something to go to sleep as well. In the long run, there has been a debate of height with the stimulants. There was a time that the studies showed that there was a decrease in height when kids were on stimulants. And then a group of studies came out saying, no, 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 no. It doesn't cause any change in height. Well, we're on the studies now saying that there is a change in height. Okay? The change in height seems not to be very significant. In other words, it's like a centimeter in the long run. Okay? So it's not that they are now going to be little guys because they take stimulants. But it's very important because it's something that is, um, uh, that is reported. Again, in follow-up, which is crucial in medication treatment, we need to follow, we need to follow their height, right? And make sure that they're still with the charts like the pediatricians use, you know, the weight and height charts, that they're still on the slope. Now we mentioned also that it can affect Actually, it can affect, uh, they, they can get stomach aches. And I failed to mention that decreased appetite is one of the, also the very common side effects to stimulants. And so kids may lose weight or they might fall off the curve in, in their weight. So it's very important to follow that. Um, when it comes to the appetite, though, they usually, because they don't have medication in the morning, they will eat a good breakfast. They don't eat very well for lunch, but they are ready to have a huge dinner by the time they get home around or around four or five o'clock. So sometimes these kids need two dinners in the evening. What non-stimulants do we have? I'm going to actually speak about the Stratera first. The Stratera was originally made as an antidepressant. Uh, the clinical trials, though, in Europe showed that it helped with ADHD. So we do not here in the States use it for depression, but we do use it for ADHD. What are the benefits of the Stratera? Well, one is it it's a non-stimulant. Two is that it works 24 hours. Okay? So while the child is awake, let's say. So 12 hours, 13 hours, 14 hours. So it's not only for school. If the child has issues at home also that need to be taken care of, then the Stratera can help as well. Okay? 
But what would be the advantage of a stimulant over the Stratera? It takes about six to eight weeks for Stratera to kick in. And you have to start it gradually. Um, so you have, they come in starter packs. Um, and it depends on the child's response to the medication, on the, um, on the side effects and how fast they can, they can be uh, titrated on the medication according to the side effects. But Stratera is a medication that does help with ADHD. It also helps with anxiety, so because it is an antidepressant. So if there are kids that tend to have anxiety problems as well as ADHD, which are very common together, Stratera might be a medication that works. If they have a tax test in a week, Stratera is not a medication that's for that child because it takes six weeks to kick in. So we also have to evaluate what the need is. The, the, um, how fast the medication needs to kick in. I'll, in ADHD, a lot of parents I'll, I'll bring their kids in on an emergency basis. They're failing. They have three weeks to make their grades go up so they can pass something. That's a pressure, right? So we sometimes have to choose medications based on that pressure. And it's not like you know they're going to fire you or anything like that, but the child has a need. So we have to take that into account. Sometimes the stimulants are used like that. And then the summer comes along and we say, OK, now we take them off the stimulant. Let's try another medication if the child needs to use, for example, a non-stimulant. And we start switching them over during the summer. So that's another kind of typical thing with children is in our clinic or in my practice, most of the changes are made during the summer. Um, not so much during school. Unless things are just not going very well, then we make the changes during the school time. OK, other medications. You might see kids with ADHD that are on Wellbutrin. And you go, well, why are they on an uh, uh, antidepressant? Well, Wellbutrin has been shown to help with ADHD. So if you have a teenager that has ADHD and has depression, then Wellbutrin might be a medication that you would like to use. Okay. What is one of the major, major side effects of Wellbutrin? Well, Wellbutrin is a medication that even though it's not a stimulant, needs to be taken in the morning. It can affect sleep, right? It also can decrease the seizure threshold, which means that if a person has seizure activity, even though it's never been presented, in other words, they've never had a drop down on the ground tonic-clonic, or no one has identified those those staring spells as seizures, but they were seizures, the Wellbutrin can bring them out. They start the medication, they have a seizure. So the Wellbutrin doesn't cause the seizures. The seizure activity was probably there. The Wellbutrin can bring it out. If a child overdose, uh, has an overdose on Wellbutrin, one of the presentations or one of the, the signs of that overdose is going to be a seizure as well. Um, Wellbutrin, again, for ADHD, kicks in pretty fast, but for depression, it'll take six to eight, six to eight weeks uh, to work. Mentioned the headaches. It also has decrease in appetite. So very similar side effects when it comes to appetite, um, when it comes to appetite and also sleep uh, issues as the stimulants. The Wellbutrin comes in different forms. Um, now there are many medications that have are still in brand name and other medications that have come out in generic because the patent is, is, a, um, is, is up. Wellbutrin, though, with my, with, in, in my experience, is a medication that is difficult to transition from the brand name to the generic. So you might see a lot of difficulty um, or a lot of symptoms reoccurring when those switches are made. This is something we need to take into account with also when we're talking about medications because a lot of the choices are not only FDA driven, a lot of the choices are driven by the insurance companies, right? They have a list of medications on the formulary, tier one, tier two, tier three, co-payments are, di are, are, uh, are different for each one. It depends again on the insurance, whether on Medicaid, whether they're on managed care. And these things are important because another limiting factor for treatment can be financial. And you know, we hear on the news and the situation's difficult right now, and I can't tell you how many parents say, I can't pay for a tier three medication. We have to think of something on tier one, right? 
And so unfortunately, we need to think about those things. We need to think about whether we order, we prescribe brand name medications or we prescribe generic medications. So all these things are important. And this is just in, on every single one of the meds at this point. Effexor. Effexor is also an antidepressant um, that is used in ADHD. Effexor has, one of the difficulties with Effexor in kids or in individuals is that weaning a person off of Effexor is very difficult. There's a lot of withdrawal symptoms that comes along with Effexor. Um, it could be a good medication. It could be an effective medication. Not so much with the ADHD as with depression, but again, taking a person off the medication like Effexor is, can be very difficult. So again, we try to cause the least amount of discomfort, and um, Effexor wouldn't be on the top of the list uh, when it comes to those. Then we have other medications simply known as blood pressure medications. Clonidine, 10X, known to lower the blood pressure, were used, medications commonly used in high blood pressure. Now they're not used to control high blood pressure. Now they're not used in that way. They do help with the hyperactive part of ADHD. In children that have failed all these other treatments, uh, in children that tend to get aggressive on stimulants, non-responsive non to Stratera, or any of the uh, other medications, then we can use the clonidine and the 10X, especially in the ones that tend to be more aggressive, have that impulsive aggression, the impulsive punching. Possible side effects to the clonidine and 10X are, well, they're blood pressure medications, so they can drop the blood pressure. What does a child look like when they drop a blood pressure? Well, it depends how much they drop it. If they significantly drop it, they pass out. If, which usually does not occur because the amount of 10X or clonidine used is a very small amount. But they can feel dizzy or they feel loopy, right? Um, or they just feel very tired. 10X and clonidine can cause sedation and actually we use clonidine for sleep as well. Uh, so these are medications, these are possible side effects to the medications. They do not help with the tension unless attention is driven the lack of attention is driven by the fact that the child can't sit still in their chair, right? If, if the attention um, is really not a problem, then when the child is less hyper, they will continue being attentive or they will be attentive.